Well, praise the Lord and welcome today to Francis and Friends. I'm going to begin the program today with a testimony. It just came into our office yesterday. In fact, one of our ladies that works our telephones took the call and she typed it up and she sent it to me so that I could share it with everyone. And it said, um, I said, Sister Francis said a man that was raised in the occult was going to work yesterday was listening to the radio and he turned across SBN FM station and the dial stopped and would not move any further. So he listened to the programming on his way to work and he recalled hearing Joseph Larson sing and he said he had never heard anything like that before. Uh, when he got to work, his co-workers tried to open his car doors for him and his car doors would not even open, <laughs> though they were not locked. He finally told them just to go on in the workplace that he would be in soon. Now, during this time, he said he felt a being, a wonderful power come inside of him. And this power filled him and he began to speak in a language that he had never heard before. The gentleman called our prayer line today and he spoke with me, Diana, wanting to know if I knew what had happened to him. He was scheduled to be installed as a high-ranking priest in the occult next week, he said. He said, well, what am I going to do now? I could never be in the occult <laughs> now. He and his family ra were raised in the satanic church for many generations uh, before, So, and he lives in Alabama. He is a little puzzled at what has happened to him and needs our prayers and support. Isn't that wonderful? That is awesome. Wow. Sister Swaggart, I called him and talked to him. Did you, Dave? Yes. And he basically said the same thing. Uh, and he uh, started praying in tongues while I was talking with him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. Isn't so that amazing? It was, it was genuine. He, he was just bum-fuzzled, mm -hmm. whatever that word means. <laughs> yeah. Didn't know what had happened to <laughs> No, him. he didn't. And uh, we talked for probably 20, 30 minutes and uh, supposed to talk to him again this afternoon. But... Uh, God did something special in his life. That is amazing. Yes. Just listening to that. And then he got his turning the dial. The dial stopped and wouldn't go any further. Got to his office and he car, his car door wouldn't open. Yeah. Wow. Now you think about that. Yes. God works in mysterious ways. Yes. <laughs> what a testimony. And, and it, this, is, this may be a door open. I led a lady to the Lord about six years ago that was in the occult. She was in the satanic occult. And she was third from the high priestess. And I led her to Jesus. She called, called on the phone and we talked. And I, and I got her to, to just, I said, Thank I'm going to lead you in the sinner's prayer. If you will say it with me and agree with it. She was demon possessed. She had three, three different times we had to stop and I had to bind the demons. But God, I didn't have no idea where he was going with this. But he told me to stay in touch with her from time to time. And in a few months, God told her to go back to the coven and tell them what Jesus did for her. And buddy, it has changed people. We don't know how many hundreds of them that could, because Jesus proved his power by what he did when she when she would talk to them. And it's it's amazing and it's still going on. So yes, that may be a, he may he may need to di to witness to those people and tell them, "Hey, this is what Jesus did for me." And he's right. real. That's and he'll, listen, Jesus will, he will show up. Yes. And he will yeah. show them his powers. He's done that over and over again in those, in those cult thing, those satanic cults, over and over again. And God has, we don't know how many has been saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. So this may be an open door. That's wonderful. Dave, did he, um, he, he didn't know anything about salvation either. No. Had no. the Holy Spirit, he probably is just, nothing. Uh, just the experience that he had and uh, the, the sensing the presence of God that was so real to him. 
Did he recognize that as a person? Oh, my mercy, yes. Uh, it great. was strange. He didn't un understand it at first, but both Diana and myself talked to him and explained, you know, what was going on, that that was, that was the presence of God, and he was just blown away by it. You know, people that are involved in Satanism and the occult, Sister Swagger, they're, they're open to the spirit world. And so when they see the real spirit of God, in comparison to what they've had to deal with, mm -hmm. uh, the different levels of demonic activities in whatever level they're at in witchcraft, when the real spirit of God shows up, they know, they can tell. So you say people that are in the occult are in Satanism, they're they are opened up more to the spirit world oh, than absolutely. normal I, people. I, I, had a, I had a friend who was a white witch, and the difference between white witch and the dark arts is the w people that are in white witchcraft think that they're using the power for good. It's still witchcraft, mm -hmm. okay? And so she was at a conference <clears throat> in Toronto, uh, Canada, and uh, it was a conference of the top white witches, and the, the keynote speaker was the highest ranking white witch. In the demonic realm, they have what's called auras. And auras are different colors that, that surround a body. And the darker the aura, the more wicked that person is. And when the highest ranking white witch went up there to speak, her aura was so black and scary that my friend at that point in time turned from witchcraft and sought God and became spirit-filled as a Christian and is living for God today as far as I know. And so, yes, they're open to things that you and I may not be open. There are times as Christians where God may allow that door to be open for a reason. Like with myself, I was ministering to people in which, that, that were witches. So to a certain degree, God would limit, but he'd allow certain things to be open to me so that I'd be aware of the authority that we have. For example, I was in a, a bookstore, I shared this before, and there's this man reading a book on the occult. I walk by, and not loud enough for him to hear, I said, the blood of Jesus Christ. And he drops the book as if it was on fire. Mm -hmm. Then turn around to see who did it. And I walked away doing the fist pump. Yes, yes. Because greater is he that's in us than yes. he that's in the world. But he that's in the world is greater than anybody in the world that doesn't know Christ. Yeah. And so it's never anything to fool around with. Uh, getting your, 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 your palm read, your future read, the tarot cards, uh, um, figuring out what your horoscope is. These are things that opens the door. Yeah, and you gotta be yeah, so, yeah. so very careful because you give the devil an inch and he'll control a mile. Well, often what people would say are white witches are actually Wiccans. Yeah, in her and, situation. But they're still witches. Yeah. yeah. They're still not saved. But I remember when you were mentioning that, Donnie sharing the story on this program of just walking through in New Orleans and there was a whole line of people telling Jackson, fortunes. Jackson Square. And, yeah. and as he was walking by this one, all of a sudden she couldn't say anything. And she looked up and said, told him to move on. He said, I don't think so. And witches realize they have no authority right. when it comes to somebody who knows their power and authority in the name of Jesus and through the shed blood, the completed work on the cross. You know, we had that experience in New Orleans as well. And um, they, and I don't know if they still do this, but they used to have these people out there and they were telling people's fortunes and so they forth still do. and so on. Yeah. They do. Yeah. And, and my husband and I walked up behind them and kind of to the side. And this woman was in the process of, and I'll never forget it. I'll never, and she stopped. She st and she was looking down. She stopped. Just froze in place. And she took her head and she turned to the side and saw my husband. I thought she's going to pass out. Mm -hmm. I mean, and she dropped her hands. She wouldn't, no, no, to all the people, you know. She wouldn't do anything else. Mm -hmm. And so we finally walked on. But it is, you know, we said, we read about it in the Word of God. Even Satan, Satan knows who Jesus Christ exactly. is. Exactly. Oh, my, yes. Exactly. And, and you think about that.
And see, and y'all weren't even challenging. Y'all weren't no. going up there. Just your presence. Just the anointing of God on your lives. Right. She sensed something walk up behind her that she was afraid of. Exactly. That's amazing. But uh, this testimony, I, you know, I've read these over the years, and you guys mm -hmm. have heard them too. Uh, but it never ceases to amaze me how God will work with yes. people. Man. The man gets in his car and starts turning his dial, and his dial won't go any further. So he's going to end. Well, just listen to that. He listened to it, and it got a hold of him. See, and as Pastor Mike said, People who are involved in the occult, in witchcraft, are so susceptible to the supernatural and strange things happening yeah. to them. For him, the dial stopping was just a supernatural event. So he would have been used to things like that happening. Yeah, you're right. You're Sister right. Swaggart, another thing talk about sensitivity to the things in the spirit world. I'm not talking about the spirit world, the capital S is in the Holy Spirit world, no, just the spirits. Um, medication, there's some medications that open doors. Yes. Right. Uh, right. Illegal drugs. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, that will open doors. And, and I've known people that, that uh, did drugs, got off drugs, but they still sometimes have these experiences that happen because that door is open. And the only way to keep the, to close that door is through what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. And it's not a situation where you have to go through some inner healing or anything like that. It's a situation you just bring it to God and, and, and leave it at the cross. Leave it at the cross. But let me let me talk to anybody who's you're dabbling with some of this stuff. It's 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 not uh, neutral. It's 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 very very dangerous. And so stop playing that uh, that game with Satan. Um, and talking about playing, there are some there are some computer games. There are some mm -hmm. some TV programs and things mm -hmm. like that that will open boards. the door. Ouija boards. Oh. my mother my mother once uh, she told me that she worked for a bank in Canada, uh, Toronto Dominion Bank, and they went to a conference. And while there, some, they, all the girls got together and, and uh, somebody brought out the Ouija board. And uh, uh, my mother didn't want to play it, but she said, okay, I'll, I'll do the same. And so they started asking, who, who is this? And my grandmother had a, a very strange name. It wasn't a name that anybody else would have known. And it starts, it, gets, it moves around to different letters, and it started spelling her name. And it got three quarters away, and my, wife, my mom just freaked out and walked away from it. Don't do that. It opens the door. It's not, it's not, uh, and I think that's, uh, um, I was going to say the name of the company that makes it, but that company also sells ordinary game boards. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just dangerous stuff. So be careful, and parents, be careful what your kids are involved in. You need to watch and check it out. So, well, uh, I'm infringing on their rights. <laughs> As Brother Donnie said, my kids don't have any rights. <laughs> it's my kids. It's, uh, he talked about the time but that he took Let me ask you a question, because I had not heard of the Ouija board. It came up on this program years ago. Yeah. And so I had to look into it to see what it was, because I'd never heard of it, much less playing it. I didn't know what it was. Um. And you're talking about that these numbers or, or letters, letters can numbers. move around right. on the board it's, to it's just to a form flat a board that has the alphabet, and then it has numbers, and then it has yes and no. And when people play it, they sit around, and you put, and it has a little dial that goes on it. It's almost like a triangle. Yes. And with most of them that I have ever seen, have like a little glass in the middle that you can actually look through and that's how you know the numbers. And you put your fingers on it lightly. And then when you ask questions, the spirits will guide that to the answer is, as Mike said, it was spelling out the name of his grandmother. It, and, and, wow. my, and wasn't something my mother was doing. She wasn't directing it because my mother freaked out when it happened, so it wasn't something that subconsciously or consciously mm -hmm. that she was attempting to do that. Uh, nor would she have attempted to to uh, to communicate 
with my mother uh, all my life she'd never there was never a time where she got involved in trying to reach or talk to somebody who's already dead or anything like that there was never an experience for her so this was not a something that she brought forth and the stories are over and over again about things like that happen ouija board by the way is tied to the the french word we oui which is yes, and I, the concept, but it's a dangerous thing. There's a lot of dangerous things out there. You've got to be so very careful. You know, Mike, I, I know I've read, after we got to discussing it, people started writing in about it and had experiences. Um, and had, to, like you talking about your mother, many of them's gotten up and run away. It was so frightening. And I'm thinking, how could a board and things that you move around on it, but... I think you said it. It's spirits in it. There are supernatural powers that are uh, of the Satan, of demons. And if, so a person, people levitating, you know, we hear of all kinds of things. That's just as real as the power of God. And mm -hmm. so we need to be very careful. Yeah. what we allow in our lives and our kids' lives and, and so forth. So what you're saying, by dabbling in stuff like that, it can get attached to your spirit. Yes. Well, and it... it and become it, a part uh, of your life. Brings up curiosity. <clears throat> yeah. Well, hey, man, this is real. I, you know, I don't, don't fiddle with it. Yeah, I had a friend who was an airline stewardess many years ago. She's in heaven now. And they had a layover in New York City, and a few of the flight crew went to the Russian Tea Room, which is a famous restaurant in Manhattan. And <clears throat> after dinner, they had a gypsy woman who came by and offered to read my friend's fortune in the tea leaves. So she read them, and she got so enamored that she started getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And before she realized, she, had, she did not become a witch, but she was allowing the occult to control her very thoughts. And the number one way most people get exposed is by reading their horoscope. Yeah, astrology. Or they, 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 they wouldn't even start their day without reading. Mm-hmm. And the world that we live in today opens us up to such susceptibility. You can't watch television without having something involved with the supernatural or something dealing with beyond. For example, these, at one time there were 18 different television programs and those were I was just going through the dial looking and I found 18 different programs that dealt in some way with the supernatural for example you had haunted towns most terrifying places ghost hunters haunted states strange evidence ancient aliens portals to hell mm. Ghost Adventures, The Dead File, Most Terrifying Places in America, Beyond the Unknown, Paranormal Caught on Camera, Paranormal Emergency, Paranormal Survivor, Paranormal 911, My Ghost Story, The Unexplained Files, Mystery, Magic, and Miracles. People watch these. I'm talking about people who have no involvement with witchcraft per se that they think. Will watch these and it piques their curiosity before you realize it. They have opened themselves up for spirits to begin to come in. Wow. And you, know, you, you drive around Baton Rouge, you can see signs oh. from fortune tellers. Oh, psychic readers. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, I would never. I've never had my fortune. I wouldn't allow. No, someone. absolutely not. And I'm. I'm known. I guess. I guess. I guess I've had enough background in it to know. Don't fool with it. It's dangerous. Another area is hypnotizing. You don't want to fiddle with hypnotizing because <laughs> no. it can open you up to spirits. Yes, you brought that up. I got a, a letter here. I've never heard anything like this. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah. It said, 
as as a Bible reading and believing Christian, I have always been brought up under belief that hypnosis is demonic. But I've noticed a trend, a trend coming up where prominent Christian pastoral figures and personal friends have mentioned how they have used Christian hypnosis to help them get through chemotherapy and labor. Mm-hmm. Alarm bells went off in my spirit uh, when I heard about this, and I think it's the same thing as Christians um, taking on a Middle Eastern spiritual, spiritual activity and p- replacing it with some Christian uh, things, and she mentioned yoga. Um, do you have any biblical references to inform the average Christian about the evils of this pristic? Have you ever heard of Christian hypnosis? No, but do you yeah. call anything Christian, whether it's... You yeah, know. We, we've taken psychology of the world, brought it into the church. Right. And so uh, you're going to find things like that because, and it's going to be said so so uh, so smoothly <clears throat> off their tongue that you think it belongs there. But, the, but hypnotizing belong. Christian hip, hypnotism to help them get chemo th- get through chemotherapy. I mean, is that are they hypnotized for one day, one hour? Usually, it's mm-hmm. it's for a defined period of time. And because the per- person who puts them under hypnosis can also bring them out basically at will. Now, they were asking if there's any scriptures. The primary scripture that I would point them to would be in Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning with verse 9, which says, When you are come into the land which the Lord thy God give thee, Now, I want you to notice God gave them this land, but they had to clean it out. You shall not learn to do after the abomination of those nations. There shall not be one found among you, anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer. A charmer basically is somebody who is a hypnotist. Or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. And necromancy is communicating with the dead. So everything that we see going on today can be found in these passages. And it's trying to work its way right back into the church. But people have to keep in mind, if they go to a fortune teller or a psychic reader, and I'm like you, I have never been. Even when I was young, I'm like, you know, yeah, that, that okay, was- that can't be from God. And if it's not from God, I don't want to be a part of it. When we mm-hmm. used to do many years ago, our schools would have a fall festival and to raise money. There was the number one most popular booth was always the fortune teller. And they would have a little booth set up and the line would be for people to go in. And of course you had to pay a little bit to go in. People need to remember the enemy doesn't know your future, but he does know your past. And it's like I was saying my friend who was the flight attendant This person read all about her past. So why would it not be unusual for a demon, for the sake of deception, of creeping on somebody's shoulder? Mm -hmm. Oh, did you realize that when they were 14 years old, this, this, and this happened to them? And then all of a sudden, Nobody knows that. How did you know? It was a spirit. <clears throat> and see, what happens, and I've seen this too often, even with Christians, somebody would tell them all about their past, and then they start predicting the future. And in order to predict the future, that person, they can't predict your future. All of a sudden, that person, well, they told me all about my past. They start planning their future. 
according to what this person told them. So it's not, they're not being predicted. That person is instructing and guiding their foot for what some medium has told them or a psychic reader or a palm reader Rather than or God. tarot card. Yeah. Tarot cards are big today. Yes, I've heard about those. And you see this on television all the time. And the more you see it on television, it desensitizes people and becomes normal way of life. You know, here's another thought. The, 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 the devil can easily use a human being to predict something that he's going to do. And so he, the things that he has control over, the things that he can do. And so we, that happens all of a sudden. We think that everything else that she said about you, which is all lies, there's a thing called self-fulfilled prophecies. And I think you were touching that. And that's the idea that uh, there was a story about a, a young man that uh, it had been uh, predicted that, he, that within, uh, within a year, he's going to have a brand new red Ford Mustang. So he kept on all throughout the year looking for opportunities. And when it started getting near the end of that year, he goes into great debt to buy a red, brand new red Mustang. And so it was fulfilled. No, he fulfilled it because he put so much mm -hmm. faith in what was said to him. We have to be so very careful. And even if times where, again, Satan knows our past. He knows our past probably better than we remember, especially when you get older. So he's able to do things like that, but he can't control our future. Mm -hmm. But how often in the church have we seen people prophesy? Prophelying. In the name of Jesus. Yeah. Oh, you're supposed to go here and here and here. Or God says there's somebody you're supposed to marry. Oh. <laughs> well, God says there's somebody you're supposed to, and they try to get them together. You, you know, during the shepherding movement, the shepherding movement was a time uh, in the 80s in which all decisions were supposed to be made by the pastor. If you were going to go on vacation, you had to bring it to the pastor. If you're going to buy a new car, you brought it to the pastor. There were times where these pastors, not being led of the Holy Spirit, would prophesy something to the lady, prophesy something different to her husband. And all of a sudden you've got a woman thinking that she's called to go to Germany and a husband thinking he's called to go to Africa. Problems happening. Uh, if there was a problem between a husband and wife, the Bible says they need to talk it out. Mm -hmm. uh, part of a marriage and a family class is how to sit down and deal with conflicts within a marriage. Mm -hmm. Well, to them, no, she's supposed to go to the pastor that puts the pastor in a very dangerous situation. And so we got to be so very careful. Let's do what the Bible says and, and, and stop trying to figure out the future. Just trust in him who holds the future. Right. And we're going to be continuing along the same line of dialogue. And we got to go to a quick break. And we'll be right back after the break. Truth. Sometimes it's hard to find. That's why there's Francis and Friends. Join Francis and Friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Francis Swigert. We're back, ladies and gentlemen, and started off on a completely different topic <laughs> than what I had. I'm going to quit planning on what we talk about in here and just go with the flow. I think it's going to be easier than that. Um, okay, I want to pick up. Jim, you were wanting to say something, I think, right before the break. I, I just, I got a, a call. I made a call yesterday to a lady that sent me the number, and she had a, um, she had a question that we might want to look at. We'll, we'll take some time to look at it, but it's in, it's in Isaiah, the eighth chapter, the eighth verse of Isaiah, and it's it, at the end of it, it, talk, it, it mentions the name uh, or the word uh, with a large O, or, or Emmanuel. And, of course, I know, I know what, what he's, he's talking about because I've done a little research on it. But we might want to talk about that if we look at it and again, Isaiah yeah. 8th chapter and the 8th verse. Okay, and mm -hmm. it shall come to pass through Judea, he shall overflow and go over, and he shall reach even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. Can you read those notes, Dave? The prophecy as well has not only a near uh, meaning, but also reaches into the far distant future of the Antichrist. The use of the word Emmanuel speaks of the Antichrist who will attempt to make this land his land 
he will fail. The statement, he shall reach even uh, to the neck, refers to the Antichrist, uh, the Assyrian attack stopping short of destroying Judah. The flood shall not submerge the head, but only rise as high as the neck. This was fulfilled under Hezekiah when the Assyrians took most of Judah, but failed to take Jerusalem, the head. Okay. Jameson okay. Foster Brown says that, that the Emmanuel has that double reference, just as Brother Swagger just said, one to the son of Isaiah and then another to uh, uh, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so there was that, that double reference. And, and a lot of times in prophecies, the rule of double reference, having a, 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 a as, as, as Brother Swagger brought out, during Hezekiah's time, but then also later on during when Jesus Christ yes. is on this earth. Yes, yes. Anybody else have a comment on that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> let, let me bring in a couple of things before we move on. Please. Uh, a scripture, Deuteronomy 13, 1, talking about the prophets and prophecy. Uh, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spoke unto you, saying, uh, it, it, a lot of times when people say, well, a prophecy's come to pass, so I need to, this is a true prophet, but let's read the rest of it. Uh, saying, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not hearken unto the words of that prophet. So if the, a prophet leads you to other gods other than uh, the true God, you don't follow them right. even if prophecies come to pass. Because um, uh, particularly we can look at during the uh, tribulation, there, Satan's going to perform all kinds of uh, miracles. miracles. That's right. So we and need, he's going to deceive a lot of people. We it. need to be careful. Another thing of going back to uh, hypnotism, Martin and Deidre Bobgan, the last name is B-O-B-G-A-N. I can't get online uh, having trouble with AT&T. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. uh, they have a whole book on hypnotism. Go to, uh, you can go on Amazon, look up Martin Bobgan, uh, the author, one of the authors, or you can go to Psycho Heresy Ministries. You can get a free ebook, a free download of it, that particular ebook if you go to their website. So uh, that will give you all kinds of information on why uh, hypnotism is not uh, scriptural. No, and in fact, as you said, Dave, earlier, anybody can put Christian in front of any word. You can just add the word, but that doesn't make it Christian. Correct. So, like, remember this. There's Christian or Christians, and there's hypnosis. Hypnosis is satanic, and it belongs on with the devil. What you do, you empty your mind, which opens right. you up to, to uh, spirits. When we were discussing this years ago on the program, a lady wrote me, and uh, she had gotten involved in this and got going to some of these. Well, she had a, a fortune teller, tell a fortune, and she, what the fortune teller told her was so real. <coughs> and it actually happened that she felt like, well, hey, this woman has an insight that I need to know more about. And she kind of kept going back to her mm -hmm. got, and got involved into the occult. And it all went on for over a period of quite a while. And she said one morning she was standing in her kitchen and a thought came to her that was not a thought that she would normally have. It was satanic. Mm -hmm. And she said it startled her. It, it startled her when that thought came into her mind. And she said that she began to, to realize that what she had been listening to was demon spirits that were speaking to her mind. And she had got sucked into it, not even wanting to be in it, not even knowing what she's doing, but she had been deceived by the devil. And folks, this stuff is real. 
Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why we're discussing it. Somebody out here needs to hear what we're saying. Um, and I, I've read some very scary things that, that have gotten involved in this. It's not easy to get out of. Mm -hmm. You don't just walk away from it. You don't. Um, anybody else have anything that you want to say concerning that subject? <laughs> if not, a panel of the phrase, God's sovereignty, uh, is the question that this man is asking about. Um, people use the phrase God's sovereignty on all of the po political ruling class. I'm not sure what he's talking about there. So what does your panel say about it? So panel, I'll ask this question. When we as Christians speak or we make statements concerning God's sovereignty, what are we saying? Most of the time, and again, it's a term that is very vague and has a lot of meanings to a lot of different people. When we use it, it's often referring that God is ultimately in control. But we also acknowledge that in God's sovereignty, his right to control anything, his right to change anything. But in that sovereignty, he has given humanity a free will. Yes. And that free will uh, allows us a choice. See, many people have a problem understanding the difference. Well, how can God be sovereign and humanity have a free will? Simple. If God can do anything that he wants to do, he can allow us to make a choice. You know, when we discuss Calvinism and we use the term free will, oh, I mean, uh, people get upset with us. Oh, yeah. What are you bringing free will into <clears throat> it? You know, all you people, you bring in free will. They hate free will. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's contrary to their teaching. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, obvious. And, and it's easier to blame God for everything yeah. than it is for humanity to take personal responsibility. Yeah. That's true. But a lot of times it's dealing with salvation where, where they get upset about that because um, there's a battle between uh, Calvinism and Arminianism. Uh, where, I, matter of fact, I, I met, met this uh, gentleman at a restaurant that actually lived in the dorms. And so it was really cool. And uh, we sat down and, and and had about a half hour talk about the Lord. And I was amazed at his knowledge of, of God's word. And, and he's from the Baptist, a Baptist background. And he talked about us being Armenians. I said, I'm not Armenians. I said, true Armenianism has the idea that by our choice alone, we can make it to heaven. And I said, and that's not true. But neither do I believe that it's all pre-selected ahead of time. Because the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish. And if God is not willing that any should perish, and that Jesus Christ died for all people, then God has the ability, if he was pre-choosing, pre-selecting who's going to go to heaven, then everybody would go to heaven. But that's not what it says. Yeah. God is sovereign, can overrule our plans. I don't know who said the plans of mice and men come to naught. Uh, we may plan things. We may organize things. We may, we, we may work toward our goal, but God could super, superimpose his will just to go something like this. He can mold things and, and change things. I remember one time I, was, I, was, uh, I owned a carpet store and I was buying a company car. And I wanted to buy the best, the top of the line of that brand of, of vehicle. And I was going in there. The company's paying for it. I'm not paying a cent. It's going to be paid by the company. So I wanted the best. So I went in there, and uh, the Holy Spirit says, I don't want you to have that. And, and I remember uh, we were getting ready to sign the contract, and I said to the young man, he said, listen, I'm going to go have a coffee. I'm going to go pray about it. You're going to what? <laughs> go pray about it. And when I prayed about it, God gave me a vision of the man ripping up the contract. So to an ordinary person, that would mean don't continue. Well, I still continued because I really wanted it. And at one point, the guy says, look, this isn't for you. And he ripped it up. And so I ended up with a vehicle, by the way, that I ended up driving down here to go to Bible college. And, and it, was a lot, it made a lot more sense for me. So God, even though I had planned something, God worked in that situation to bring out his plan in our life. And so we God, have to be very careful with that. God will not force somebody to get saved. 
Exactly. Mm -mm. That's why just because we pray and something may be God's will, it's God's will that everybody be saved, but I can't, for that's what, what's wrong with the word of faith. I can't force things to happen when people are involved. That's right. I can't, for I pray for uh, loved ones who are unsaved and I pray, but that's not going to force them to get saved. They have to make that choice right. themselves. And God can't and won't force people. That's right. Well, look at it the other side. He won't force people to go to hell either because he's made a way they don't have to go to hell if they choose not to. And if I choose to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I'm saved. Absolutely. I don't care what anybody says, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. Any of us can yes. do that. Yes, exactly. Right. Okay. Uh, should we be praying, panel, for the men that did the killing of the Jewish, Jewish people on October the 7th? Do we pray for them to be saved? So, I have had a hard time praying for them. I don't know if that's wrong or right. I just have a hard time for the evil that they did. And I think that when you look, you begin praying to somebody and you look at what they've done, that will bring this kind of, why are you praying for them? What do you say to this man? Do you pray? For the people we that do. kill those sure. Jewish people. It's Enemy. always God's will to pray for the lost to be saved. Yes. And that includes the Hamas terrorist who invaded on October 7th. But now, part of the reason we have a difficult time praying for them is we have a difficult time forgiving them. Mm -hmm. For what they did. For so what evil. they did. <clears throat> but here's the reality. If we pray and they actually got saved, their sorrow and their feelings for what they did and the true significance of it will cause <laughs> more harm to themselves as far as that mental anguish and torment than anything we could do. Now, just because they get saved, that doesn't mean that there's not a penalty to pay for the atrocities they committed. You know, so, you're talking, and, and something is coming to my mind, and I may have it a little wrong, so correct me, panel, yeah. if I am. But I'm thinking about the man that bombed Pearl Harbor. Yes. yes. That pulled that lever and dropped those bombs and didn't he later get saved? Yes, yes. sure did. He spent yes. the rest of his life ministering. In and he came to America yep. yes. to preach the gospel. That's right. He was the the flight <laughs> leader right. of yes. the squadron who, and he led the attack. Yes, on Torah, the Torah, Torah. Yeah. The, what about Ananias? The Apostle Paul. Yeah. God went to Ananias and he said, you go pray for Paul. Well, he was Saul at that time. And that man said, do you know who that is? <laughs> right. He was coming to Damascus to have more people killed, killed and put in prison and beaten. And God told him to go and to pray for Saul of Tarsus. That's a good example. Mm -hmm. I mean, Very he, good. no telling how many people oh. he had killed just because they were Christians. Exactly. You know, when 9-11 happened, Osama bin Laden and all of that, I remember in Salvation Station, kids coming up, Pastor Mike, can we pray for him that he gets saved? And I thought it was so cool because children understood it. If we're supposed to pray for our enemies and those who despitefully use us, yes. that takes everybody. That, that encumbers everybody, whether they're friend or foe, we are to pray for them. Now, uh, if they do accept Christ, praise God. There were so many um, Nazi officers that eventually got saved uh, after the war. They realized what they've done. Uh, some of them go into Nuremberg, uh, Nuremberg and some of them not. Um, Corey Ten Boom talks about how she had to deal with praying for the guards and, and uh, uh, her sister had a, a large role to play in helping her to understand that when Jesus Christ died for us, 
that love that he expressed for us, we should express for other people. And when we think that somebody is beyond the reach of the gospel, then it's pride. Or else we don't understand just what God saved from. Brother Swagger made that comment that the lost don't know how lost they are and the, the saved don't know how saved they are. Mm -hmm. And when we understand and we look at our past with the right color lens, not rosy lens, we understand what God saved us from, then we should be more open to reaching out to those that need God's grace. Here's what people say concerning this. And this is what bothers them and they haven't gotten an answer to it. Why should I pray for them? Think, that think they of, would get saved. Think Let, of the parents of some of the daughters that were raped oh, multiple it, times. It was horrible. Think of some of the kids. <clears throat> their mother was raped and killed and babies cut out of their womb. Think of husbands. Should they pray? Mm -hmm. Me, read Matthew 18. Person who has owed a large debt was forgiven. And then somebody that owed that individual a small debt came and said, uh, let me pay, I'll, I'll pay it. And they said no and had him put in prison. What did Jesus say? That person, I'm gonna make you pay because you were unmerciful. Look at how much I forgave you for and you wouldn't forgive somebody. Now we don't think, I. I Think about somebody who's abused as a small child mm. by their father yes, I've for heard years. Yeah. yeah. Should they forgive? Yes. How? Yes. Yeah. By realizing how much God has forgiven us for. Yes. Amen. That's not easy. Amen. And only God can help us to do that. Sister Swaggart, Masab Youssef, he's the son of West Bank Hamas leader, Sheikh Hassan Youssef. Yes. Accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Yes. And he's praying that his family. That's right. Those that were involved in that, that his family would also accept Jesus Christ. But here's what people say, Mike, that, you know, you're telling me to pray that this person gets saved. No, the Bible's telling us, yeah. Yes, yeah. all right, but we're telling them to. Right. According to what the Bible said, to pray for them. But why should I pray for them? And if they got saved, then they would have had a chance to get saved. But those persons that they killed, they didn't have that chance, second chance. They didn't have another chance to get saved. And this is what and I'm talking about good Christian people. So are you, you know, what makes one better than the other? That these, after they've committed this horrible crime, now they're going to be given an opportunity and they can accept Jesus Christ, but the persons that they killed will never have that opportunity. But the mercy, and that's what hurts them. The mercy of God. Mm -hmm. You know, if the Apostle Paul could pray for Nero and the Apostle Paul can pray for the Romans in his day, because remember, he's the one who tell, he, he also yeah. tells us to pray for, for, for the governments that, that yeah. are in charge. Mm -hmm. And who was in charge? Rome was. Mm -hmm. And the, the very man that he was praying for was the man who cut off his head. You know, I'm thinking, Mike, of this lady, uh, I read this family. They were just fixing to sit down to, to breakfast. The wife had prepared breakfast, set the table, had the table set. And all of a sudden, these criminals, these outlaws, these whatever you want, terrorists, burst through their front door yes. and wound up killing the whole family yes. or taking them hostage. I forget exactly what it was. And so you talk about Merciful Dave. Was God merciful to that family that was just fixing innocently sit down and eat their breakfast? Was that mercy, God's mercy, that allowed them to be killed? I'm, I'm pressing we, this we don't because understand. people are struggling with it. Yeah, we don't understand, but God requires us, if we have received mercy... To give mercy. Yes. Blessed right. are the merciful. And we have to keep in mind as well, we live in a fallen world. And the fallen world as a result of the garden. I remember as a child, we talking about praying for forgiveness. When I was 
very, very young, and I'm talking five, six years old, and very, very naive. I used to pray the devil would get saved. <laughs> and, and in my little brain, I used to think, well, if the devil got saved, the people wouldn't be doing all the bad things. You would be surprised how many people write me and ask, shouldn't we be praying for the devil to get mm -hmm. saved? No. No, he can't. Because he's Is like the created beings. Yes. We, we had a girl, in, in, and this was in, uh, uh, it was in, one of the, I don't know if it was marriage in the family class. I don't think it was because you would have been there. Uh, but this girl got up and she starts crying. She says, why can't we just all get along? Why can't Jesus just forgive Satan? <laughs> and the whole class just stared at her as if, <laughs> as if, do you understand what you just said? No, no, he is, uh, there's no opportunity. This is one of the problems with the inclusion doctrine or the ultimate reconciliation doctrine that says at the very end, God will forgive everybody and everybody gets to go to heaven. No matter how you lived your life, demons will be forgiven and Satan will be in heaven. No, the scripture doesn't, ta it doesn't say that. You know, you can pray all you want against the scripture. The scripture right. will go the way it's said. Right. And it's very clear in the scripture that, that, that Satan cannot be redeemed. His eternal destiny is already determined. Absolutely. Yes. So it's a waste of time. You that are listening right now and you want to pray for Satan, um, he's, his destiny is already, he's already made his but decision. People need to understand when you don't forgive somebody, you're not hurting that person, you're hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. Let me read you this email right here, Dave. It goes along with this. Why does God allow little kids to be brutally raped and murdered? He is more powerful than Satan, so why does he want children to die and be raped? Well, we know that's not God. He doesn't want that. Okay, he is, God is supposed to protect our children and be with them. I am really bothered by this, and please help me because I don't understand. We're going to pick this conversation up right after the break because we got to go to a quick break, and let me say this. After this break, we will be taking your telephone calls, so if you have a question or comment you'd like to engage with the panel about, that number is 800-342-8. 430, a toll free number you don't pay for it. We do. We want you to call or email us on air at jsm.org and we'll be right back in just a moment. Find out more about Francis and Friends on our website, francisandfriends.com. Previous Fran programs are available online at sunlifetv.com. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. And uh, do uh, Dr. Dupree, you were saying something, and I, to I interrupted you and said, I want you to say that over the air. You was telling this something during the break. Well, we were talking about why, if God could stop, why doesn't he stop bad things from happening? Children being raped. Particularly children. children. Killed, yeah. And God gets blamed for everything. If a tornado or a hurricane or something goes through, the insurance companies will call that an act of God. And yet in Romans, or I'm sorry, John chapter 10 and verse 10, it said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I am come that you may have life and have life more abundantly. People don't blame the enemy for it. Right. But people <laughs> will them. say, um, well, why did God allow Eve to eat the apple? We have to keep in mind that all of creation is created. Humanity, after Adam and Eve, is conceived. Adam and Eve were the only two created human beings. After them, everyone else in humanity conceived. is conceived. We are the only ones that have the right to truly repent. Angels and spiritual beings were created. Now they have a choice, but the problem is if they fall, as we've seen fallen angels, there is no repentance for them. And there's no redemption for that. And is there it? is no redemption for them. We have a right to repent. And we are the only ones 
as Romans chapter 8 and verse 17 says, we are heirs of the Father, joint heirs with Christ Jesus. We are the ones who are giving that authority that comes from God because we are conceived and we have a right of repentance. We have a right to apply the completed work of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection. Because in Romans chapter uh, four, verse 25, it says, he was delivered for our offenses, raised again for our justification. So we have to keep in mind it's not God who does these things. And yet, while he could prevent it, and we've seen cases, and we've heard testimonies over the years of where God did supernaturally intervene. Right. right. But it, that doesn't always happen. Is he showing partiality then? No, we don't know the circumstances behind the ones that were spared. So does that mean that Adam and Eve cannot be saved? No. Because they, if you go back and look, when they fell and realized their state, they created a covering of fig leaves. Well, but that doesn't save you. That doesn't save them. When God came, it said that he made them a covering of animal skin. Well, I'm not a hunter. So <laughs> if you ask me to clean something, I wouldn't have a clue where to begin. But I know enough to realize you can't have an animal skin without that animal shedding its blood. So the covering that God provided for Adam and Eve included the blood. Okay, so are you saying then, because we had a big discussion at times on this program, that Adam and Eve were saved. Were they saved or not saved? And did, uh, I think we, well, how did we conclude that they weren't saved? I believe we've discussed it a lot, <laughs> several different times about Adam and Eve. So do you feel like they were saved then? I hope they were. Well, we it, all do. It's hard, it's hard for us to say anyone was or was not because we weren't there. We don't know their heart. We don't know the state of their repentance. Do you believe if if you ask me, I would say yes. You believe they, they went because, to that one, huh? And again, I would do it because God made them a covering of skin, which included the shedding of blood. And we know that their sons came and ate, Cain and Abel, that Abel offered a sacrifice that included blood. Well, where did he learn about learn that about blood sacrifice? sacrifice. Mm -hmm. He had to have learned it from his parents. Or else God spoke to him directly. Or God could have done it. Yes. So that's not one of those issues that I'm going to get too hung up about. <laughs> because, again, none of us were there. I was just wanting your opinion because we've had a big discussion at times about this on this program here. A lot of people have questions about it. Were, did they make it to heaven? Were they saved? And you feel like they did. I feel like they did because of the sacrifice God made for them, hmm. which was the first reference to a blood sacrifice, an indirect one, but it was still an indirect reference to a blood right. sacrifice because of the animal skin. And you would have a lot of people that disagree with that. Sure. And that's okay. That's your belief. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I don't... I, and you're not... I understand. I, I was just wanting to clarify that. Um, uh, it, okay, Mike, you want to say something to no, that? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. He's not going to bring up the discussion. I think he, I, I, I I think will, he I will, does. Because I don't, I, don't, I don't shy from controversy. Um, these are the reasons why I feel that they may not have been. We don't know for sure, and you're absolutely right. Uh, number one, we don't see them asking for forgiveness. We don't see an attempt on their part of any repentance. Number two, we don't see them sacrificing when Cain and Abel were sacrificing. And again, you may be right. They may have instructed their children what to do, or God may have told them personally. When I did inner city bus ministry, I remember this one gentleman. He was one of the biggest crack dealers 
in Valley Park area, which is down off of college. And, uh, but every Saturday he made sure his kids came to hear from Jimmy Swagger Ministries ride the buses when we did bus ministry. We'd bring in 1,400 kids every Saturday. And uh, thank you, Sister Swagger, for doing that for us and allowing us to do that. And he made sure he didn't want anything to do with God, but he made sure his children. So the fact that Cain and Abel knew, well, Cain didn't really follow through on that, but Abel certainly did uh, know what to sacrifice can mean that God told them. It could mean that Adam and Eve told them, but we don't see them involved in that. The other thing is throughout the discussion in the New Testament, when it comes to Adam, Adam is the type of the fall, not a type of redeemed man. If he had repented, wouldn't you think that the scripture would have used that? That would have been a great example. So I'm not leaning toward they did. I'm more leaning toward they didn't because we don't see them asking for forgiveness. But here's, here's would be my response, would be there are many things the Bible does not tell us. Yeah. And just because the Bible does not say that he repented, yeah. that doesn't mean he didn't. Well, certainly, First certainly of all, I agree. But second of all, is we know very, very little about Adam and Eve because the scriptures really don't give us a lot of details right. of their life after the garden. You're absolutely right. So, and, and I think there's a reason why the Holy Spirit doesn't, that keeps that quiet there because of, uh, to, to me, again, it's a typology. But I'm just addressing the point that when they would have put the skins on, probably there would have still been blood on the skin. So they would have physically had the blood. But uh, even, even in the Old Testament, the idea of bringing a sacrifice to the altar of the Lord. Uh, you look at uh, Malachi. Malachi talking about those bringing sacrifices, but God didn't accept the sacrifices because they didn't have a broken and contrite heart. And so I'm just, you know, again, I think this is one of the things that uh, uh, you can you can swallow an, an, a, a, what was it, strain in a gnat and, and, and swallow an elephant or whatever. Well, it's one of those things that I think we spend a lot of time talking about things that cannot be biblically proof yep. and Agreed. really has very little Agreed. to do with our walk with Christ today. We can have our preference and we can have our individual belief, but in the long run, that doesn't change our walk with God today. But I think that, in, and Brother David brought it up, I think from the aspect of we were talking about free choice as to, as to whether they had free choice. And Adam and Eve, in my opinion, had a choice. Adam had a choice to partake of the fruit mm -hmm. or not to partake. When his wife Eve partook of the fruit and handed it to him, and if the scripture is correct, it said, and he was with her. So he was with her when she partook of the fruit. Now, some denominations said, no, he wasn't there at the moment, but that's not what the scripture says. She partook of the fruit and gave it to her husband who was with her. He never attempted to stop the, the, her from taking the fruit. He never, he could have refused to partake of the same fruit. He didn't have to do that. He had a free will. And he didn't have to believe what she said. Exactly. He right. heard even, what God said. That's right. Exactly. And he even heard what afterwards, God said. Right. Even afterwards, when he, when he was removed from the garden, which I think was an act of grace on God's part, by the way, at that point of time, he could have, and, but there was no, there's no sign of that. And again, Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. In but other words, again, just because it doesn't say it. I would have to get yeah. back to the point that after they left the garden, almost nothing is known about Adam and Eve. Right. And they lived for hundreds of a years. great period of time afterwards. So, and again, I would, I still lean towards, because I think we serve a gracious and a merciful God who's more willing to show mercy and forgiveness there's still something on our judgment. part we have to do. It's not, we, and yes, that's, that's what but, I'm saying. But you also have to think about the earth had to be populated. Yes. And it had to have people. Mm-hmm. So it was important that Adam and Eve be here to help repopulate, the, or not repopulate, but, but to populate the earth. And I think, and I'm going to try to say this as judiciously as possible so we don't get into another discussion because <laughs> we have some callers. 
But we know there are great godly characters throughout the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, who created and, and committed atrocious sins that we know by their future actions, they were repentant. Although the Bible doesn't say they repented. So does that mean they didn't repent because the Bible specifically says they didn't repent? But we know by their actions that they did. And they were godly men and women and would have com created and committed acts that we would have committed just horrendous today. And yet the Bible doesn't specifically say they repented of those actions. And yet we read about the great, beautiful repentance of David. Exactly. Nothing many more precious or beautiful in the because we've had that discussion before. Yeah. It doesn't say that he committed or he repented. His adultery. Yeah, but Psalm you know. 51 does. But we know that he did. Right. right. Well, but I think the scriptures after that that said, Lord, uh, when he's praying and crying, he talked about oh. being unworthy. He talked about... Yeah. Um, the power of God working in his life. I yes. can't think. I'm, I had it right on the tip of my tongue. I apologize. Uh, but I think there are... are, are oh, there, there are many, many. And I'm just talking about that one specific incident, okay. not his life. Take my wicked heart. My, my well, it's, he, you know, it's like he wrote in Psalms 139, verse 23 and mm -hmm. 24. Search me, O Lord, yeah. and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Reveal if there's anything wicked, but be in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. So we know by his action right. and words, yes, he was repentant. Right, right. Let's go to our first caller today and invite them in on these conversations. Andrea in Connecticut, welcome to Sun Life Broadcasting. You have a question or comment for the panel? I have a question. And also um, a comment. Okay. Um, you were speaking about you know, the Ouija board and, and sorcerers. Right. And people turning into that. Um, what about mediums? I have a family member who passed away who is a Christian and sought the advice or, or trying to get to her child who had passed away. And when she told me she spoke to him, um, she also said that my mother, who died 10 years earlier, had come through. And would I like to speak, what, find out what this person had said to her about my mother? And I said, absolutely not. I said, first of all, one day in heaven is a thousand years on earth. So right now, she's gone for 10 years. She's probably only been there for a minute, and she's saying hello to everybody. And, and she doesn't have time to be thinking about me. She's so in love with what she sees in the Lord. And that's the same thing with your son, but I cannot convince her. And there's so many people who are dealing with this sadness that they're seeking other devices instead of going to the Lord. And I don't know how to tell her that it's an evil spirit or what it's is it that's spirit. coming through and giving her information. Yes, it's a familiar spirit. It's demonic. Yes, very dangerous. Right. Very, very dangerous. Yes. Tell her about King yeah. Saul. <clears throat> yes. And the witch of Ender. And the witch. Yeah, yeah. Do you also feel that what I had said to her about the time in heaven is just a blink of an eye that she's been up there? Because as we, as I stated, one day in heaven is a thousand years in earth so they're really just up there a second or so is that do you feel that's correct there's no communication with us and and, and the people that show, that's in heaven yeah I, th I think your analogy oh, is good i think your analogy is good yeah. uh but the most important way of i think dealing with this another way of dealing with it let me put it that way is the fact that 
the whole idea that you go to somebody who works for the kingdom of darkness to find out what's happening in the kingdom of light doesn't even make sense. Yeah. Why would I go to somebody who who actively wants to seek the approval of Lucifer and, and ask them about what's happening in heaven? It just doesn't make sense. Um, the reason why God doesn't let us have that portal to go back and forth and communicate with people in heaven is because our eyes would then be off of him and onto these people. It's like the Roman Catholic the church who says that Mary is a co-redemptress and the co-mediatrix uh, between man and God and uh, whatever you want go through Mary and she cannot be refused and that's in the catechism by the way uh, and so uh, again you can't go to Mary you can't go to a saint you can't go to anybody that's in heaven that is verboten that's forbidden in God's word therefore to communicate with that um, are there times where God may allow someone to have a dream or a vision about a loved one and that loved one encourages them? There might be, but you've got to be so, so very careful with that because you can open a door. And I would get back to the same scripture we read and talked about earlier in the program today in Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning with verse 9 and go down through verse 12 where it specifically names any of the occultic or false or demonic activities. So, Also, First uh, John 4, 1 talks about test every spirit to see if they're from God. Right. So you've got to make sure that you're not listening to spirits that are not from God. <laughs> and the spirits are from God are through the Holy Spirit. Question she needs to answer, why is this individual so consumed with communicating with someone who has died. They need to come to a point where they accept that. That's exactly. that, that person has become an idol in their life. Yeah. That's good. That's good. I mean, I have peace of mind. I never, ever doubt it where my family is. I think people who may not know want to have an answer to somebody else. But these people are coming off as they're Christians that they have mm -hmm. they have connections with angels and the Lord. And so many shows like that that are coming through that they're good people. I always say good people don't go to heaven, safe people do. Yes. Right. Yep. Um, can, can I mention another thing? Yes, go ahead, Andrea. A couple of days ago, um, somebody was mentioning about the holes in Jesus' hands. And what I re researched and remembered was that they couldn't put them in his hands because there were bones there that could be broken. And if I'm not mistaken, Jesus was supposed to be a sacrifice with no bones broken. Am I right? Right. Correct. Right. None of his bones should be broken. The, <clears throat> the Jewish definition of a hand is actually right. from the wrist up. And one of the reasons why it wouldn't be here is because there's so much flesh here that the nail could actually pull through. The Romans would have done through here. And so this is a uh, matter of interest when you look at the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin, which is you know, a big debate as to how legitimate it is, but it's interesting the Shroud of Turin has it here. But history proves from actual uh, 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 hands that they found, the bones, with the nail going through here. And so it, 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 that's another point that, sorry, the Shroud of Turin has it here where all of the paintings in that era had the nail print there, which... But it, if they've sense. got it here, it, it won't, it can't pull through. It can't pull through. It's, yeah, and that and person the can hang have, there. Romans that person would have known can hang that there by across. experience. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. right. remember, if a, if a, if a prisoner escaped, that that guard was to be crucified, and so they want to make sure. So it was yeah. they crucified yeah. people by the thousands. Yeah. Yes. yes, they did. Yes, <laughs> isn't that hard? Mm -hmm. All right, I hope we've helped you some there, Andrea. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. And thank you for calling, Randy in Missouri. I'm not broadcasting. Okay, you have a question or comment, Randy? Oh uh, yes. Uh -oh. Thank you all for uh, taking my call. I love you all and the brother and the, uh, the ministry. Uh, I'll just have a question on what a few words mean. In uh, Galatians chapter 5, and it starts at the end of uh, verse 19. I need to ask 
one of the brethren, uh, what somebody's words of doing. I got them on the line, so I'll be quick and we'll take all your time up. Okay, now the works of the flesh uh, are manifest, which are these. And Dave, are you where you can read those notes there in, in the expository? Yes. If one attempts to function by means of law uh, of any nature, the works of the flesh will be manifested in one's lives. Yes. And then the verse of Scripture says, uh, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, um, and then verse 20, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedations, and heresies. Yeah, I need to know, uh, <clears throat> uh, going back, uh, well, at the end of verse 19, uh, I know what uh, adultery is, I know what fornication is, and I know what uncleanliness is. Yeah, now the works uh, of the flesh, let's read that again. Now the works of the flesh. What does that viciousness mean? I'm sorry, I interrupted What does you. lasciviousness mean? It's oh, outrageous, okay. immoral behavior. Oh, okay, no problem there. Uh, I know what idolatry is, witchcraft, and hatred. What does variance mean? Argumentative. Always. Uh, if somebody says it's a day, you say it's night. They say it's warm, you say it's cold. Variance is always a disagreeable spirit. Yeah. A contentious oh, okay. spirit. Uh, good enough. Uh, what is emulation to me? Sorry? Emulations. Oh. What emulations? Just trying to keep up with the Joneses. Jealousy, okay. envy. How about wrath? I'm sorry? Yeah. What does wrath mean? What? Wrath? Wrath. Wrath. It's a That's word anger. For anger. Yeah. Yeah. Is that thumas? Yeah. It's, it's, it's just thumos, anger. Yeah. And but explosive anger. It's, a strong, it's passionate uncontrollable anger. anger. Yeah. It's like people oh, who have... Okay. That's good. Uh, uh, what does strife mean? Strife is keeping something stirred up yeah. all the time and one yeah. person against another. Oh, no problem. I, uh, I don't really catch it up, but I know uh, your time is important. Uh, okay, okay. What's seditions? The next one. Seditions. Seditions? Yes. Divisions? Sedition. Seditions is divisions. Yeah. Dissension yeah. in the groups. Always trying to cause problems. Oh, no. Okay. What does always mean? False doctrine. Okay, uh, and, uh, verse, uh, and the next verse is, uh, uh, okay. All right, and look, I apologize, but we got to go to a quick break, and we're going to be right back after the break, continuing taking your calls and your questions. Email your questions and comments about today's program to onair at jsm.org. Opposing opinions and viewpoints are always welcome. Onair at jsm.org. All right, we're back, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to Billy in Indiana. And Billy, welcome to Sun Life Broadcasting. You have a quick question or comment for the panel? Hello? Yes, Billy. Welcome to Sun Life. You have a question or comment? I sure do. Thanks for, for taking the sure. call today. And God's richest blessings upon all of you in Jesus' name. Thank you for your ministry. I'm a receiver of the fruit. I um, was I wanted to t chime in on the topic about Adam and Eve. Um, uh, Jen, I've heard you guys talk about this before, and it's um, really inspired me to search this. Find 
verse that he said, I'm the Lord thy God, I will have mercy on who I choose to have mercy, was always intriguing to me that it was God himself as the expositor's Bible. Um, the notes that Brother Swagger has, it talks about in Genesis 3, 21, where unto Adam and also his wife, the Lord God made coats of skins and clothed them. And clothed them. The, the notes talk about how it was the plan of God. The Lord provided this grace and this mercy. But the verse right before it in Genesis 3, 20 is what my question is about. It says Adam, who was responsible of giving names to everything, Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And I'm, the Holy Spirit is kind of giving me so, some question I wanted to ask you. Doesn't that demonstrate faith on Adam's part that he believed God's word that life would come from Eve? But you're talking about physical life. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I mean, Adam named Eve the mother of all living, and, but God had told them that she was going to bring the the seed. You know, it was her seed that the Redeemer was going to come from, and you know, Adam named Eve the mother of all living. And so, at, at that point, it seems what I'm questioning and wondering is, I mean, that's the only evidence I could see where a change of heart in Adam's state of death and sin and death, he he believed God was going to be the one to produce life through that promise he made according to his word and then he named Eve the mother of all living and it was right after that the next verse is when God sacrificed, made the sacrifice and clothed them into the skin so it's just a pondering thing for thought we don't I've heard you guys talk about this topic a lot and it seems like there's really a hard place to ever find evidence that Adam and Eve would have repented yeah okay Mike go ahead yeah uh, Genesis 3 16 God tells them that she's going to produce fruit uh, unto the woman he said I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. So uh, Adam is just going on what 316 is. Now what you were talking about is what's called the proto-evangelium, the first promise, the first gospel, if you would like, the first good news, and that's found in 315. And I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And that's in reference to Christ. Because a woman doesn't produce a seed, she produces an egg. And so this has to deal with the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, who will then be uh, our victory. And so, um, yeah, I understand what you're saying. But again, verse 16, just a, a few verses before it, we have the Lord telling him that you're going to live, and you're going to produce children, but it's not going to be in the garden. Right, and I'm, I'm totally alignment with that. That's that's kind of what the, the thing that led me to see there in verse twenty. Choose to name Eve the mother of all living. That word of all living, and it just is just the an act of faith, saying, "I believe God's word. I don't know how He's going to do it, but I'm going to name my this woman Eve, mother of all living, because God is." That's his word. He's going to produce a redeemer somewhere on that line, oh, that, which would be the virgin birth. Obviously, we know that to be a fact. I just wondered how what your thoughts are if, if you see that as an act of faith on Adam's part. You know what I mean? I think it's just an act of obedience. He, God just spoke to him. Mm -hmm. uh, and God, uh, he knows at that point of time, it wasn't as if he really needed to. Believe it or not, God told him this was what's going to happen. And so it's part of the punishment, if you would like, the wages of sin upon uh, Again, there were certain things put upon Adam, for example, by the sweat of his brow. Everything before that was easy. But now, because of sin, by the sweat of his brow would he eat. Uh, he would toil. Uh, he would have opposition. We know at that point of time, uh, even the peaceful animals had changed after that point. So right. sin made a, it wasn't a small change in God's creation. All of creation was yes. affected by the fall. But what God had provided for him up until that point. Or right. he, did, he, right. he, had, he had relished in God's provision. He was no longer going to have God provide for him. Adam was going to have to make his own way, earn his own way, you might say. Amen. I, I love what you um, brought out there, Pastor Musrall, is, is it was an act of obedience. I, yeah. I really stresses the importance of us to choose willful obedience according to the Word of God Amen. in our walk. Amen. Amen. Taking my call. And can, I, can I just comment on one more thing about the, 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 the bones and the wrist? Okay, sure. Um, Go ahead. 
I'll make it real quick. That, that there's a that scripture of Elisha, Elisha the prophet, when the man borrowed the axe head and it was lost. He told him to go get a stick, a tree, you know, which I believe was a type of the cross and how God fashioned the creation, the plan of redemption before the foundation of the world. The master carpenter, the creator, God, he created the a master, you know, carpenter's ta tap died out where those holes would already be preordained to go. So it, it seems to me we can still put our fingers in the preordained holes that have been we were made into the image of the finished Messiah. You know, it's just, that's just something that I've always pondered on. That he told Thomas he could put his fingers in those holes, and he still kind of allows us to feel where those holes are because no bones were broken by the Romans. It was God who created that skeletal structure so the would float. That's just my own opinion yeah. on, on that. I, I, I believe God created the skeletal structure. In the I can't. Of I'm, I'm sitting here trying to think why uh, somebody would want to put their fingers in those holes in Jesus' hand. To prove that he was the Messiah. Thomas. Does that prove, though, they're asking that question in unbelief? Well, look at... Yeah. When Thomas was actually the resurrected Christ presence. We don't have a record of where he actually reached out and touched. But he saw the holes. He saw the holes. Yeah. And yeah. recognized that the, he was right. the Messiah. Yeah. Thank you, Billy. Uh, we're going to Michael in Iowa. And Michael, welcome to Sun Life Broadcasting. You have a question or comment? Yeah, yes. Good morning, Sister. Fred. Good morning. You know, it's so good to be on your show today. All right. You have a question or comment? Um, Yes, ma'am. I would like to start by saying back retired Marine who deals with a lot of PTSD. So when you hear this, it, maybe that would help put things in a little bit of perspective for you. Back in December, I was sitting on the living room sofa and out of nowhere, I got a strange sense of committing suicide. The prior day before that, I learned that one of the brothers that I served in Desert Storm with committed suicide, and I guess it just overwhelmed me. And I just got out of, out of the sofa, didn't tell my wife where I was going, went to the nearest park, and I sat down on a snow-covered park bench with snow coming down, and I seriously, seriously considered ending my life. I called a local church that is right by our neighborhood, and I just wanted clarification to know that if I were to ask God and pray that if I commit suicide, will you please forgive me and let me go to heaven? The answer that I got is going to astonish you. I was told absolutely yes, that God would forgive me and I, he would be waiting the Bible for me says, the op, the, Michael, the the, Michael, Michael, the Bible says the opposite of that, and God doesn't contradict his word. I agree. Something did not feel right with me by that response, and it felt like at that moment God's conviction was telling me, you're wrong. That is so wrong. Yes. Yeah, I think, I think yeah, what, what, you, what you were sensing was not from God, it was from Satan. Amen to that. That's a lie. And Michael, as thank as, you, as thank as you for serving. Off that phone, the, the song yeah. "There Is Peace in the River" came over my head and played constantly, constantly, constantly. I came home, got down on my knees, turned on SBN, and Family Resurrection Choir was singing, "Let down your net, way down in the water." Because there's a blessing waiting you cannot contain. Amen. <laughs> I got down on my knees. I began to cry like an infant, raised my hands towards heaven and asked God to please rebuke Satan, get his thoughts, his actions, his mind control out of my mind, mm -hmm. bless me, send me your protection, to continue to work in my life and bless me. Fast forward to today, my life has been filled with constant peace, compassion, love, there's no suicidal thoughts there. I have SBN turned on every single day, 24-7. Praise God. I just want to thank you, Swagger family and the associate pastors, for doing everything that you can to reach and teach this yes. gospel of Christ and him crucified. It doesn't matter if he was, if he was scarred in the wrist or the hands. 
just the fact that he was crucified Amen. and died for me. Amen. That's faith, Michael. Right with you, Sister Francis, I would like to ask if it was okay if Brother Dupree would please lead me into the sinner's prayer and ask for God's protection of my life, please. Yes. If that would be okay. I will do that, and Michael, let me thank you for your service. Amen. Yes. 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 You may have heard me say over time, I've got many Marines in my family. Brother, cousin, two nephews, three uncles. I actually had an uncle, and this would mean something to you, who was at Chosen Reservoir. And yes, so being a Marine, he would understand the significance of that. Mm -hmm. So for me, it is an honor for me to be able to pray. May I say, simplify to you. Amen. Five, sir. Thank you. And, and let's pray. Yes. And I'd like you to pray Praise this God. with me. Pray. Father. God. Yes, sir. Say this, Father. Father I come Father, to you in Jesus' name. I come to you in Jesus' name. Admitting I need a Savior. Admitting that I. And at this moment, forgive me of my sins. And at this moment, please forgive me. And write my name in the book of life. And write my name in the book of life. Jesus. Jesus. I accept you now as my Lord and Savior. I accept you now as my Lord and Savior. My old life is done. My old life is done. And at this moment, and at this moment, I begin my new life in Christ Jesus. I begin my new life in Christ Jesus. I praise God. Knowing that Jesus, knowing that Jesus nailed my sins nailed my sins to the cross to the cross and he forgives me even now and he forgives me even now thank you father thank you father that I am saved amen, amen. that I am saved Praise my God. life belongs yeah. to Jesus from this moment forward my life belongs to Jesus from this moment yes. on. Amen. Yes. Thank Amen. you, Father. Amen. Michael, don't Amen. ever Amen. doubt from this Hallelujah. day forward. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for that honor, Michael. But thank you even more that your name is written in the book of life and do not ever allow the enemy to try to convince you that you are not saved. Oh, Jesus, thank you, Brother Dupree. Thank you, Swagger family. And, and, and let, 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 me, let me tell you, Michael, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Smith. And he will he will let you know what that is. You follow him. Amen. Let him lead you and guide you. And he will let you know what that plan and purpose is. Well, like it says, I don't give up on God and God will never give up on me. Amen. 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 That's right. Are you saved, Michael? Yes, I am, ma'am. <laughs> I wanted to hear you. That, I wanted to hear that confession. Praise God for that. And thank you for calling, Michael. Thank you for calling. Praise God. Praise God. That's just how quick it takes. Amen. A sincere heart that is repentant before the Lord is saved instantly. Amen. That quick. That quick. That's exactly right. Um, all right. Go into another uh, email panel.
It said, Francis, and this pertains to yesterday's program. Thank you for reading this passage about the rich man and the poor man. Now, doesn't this example prove that Jesus was against rich people and that they are destined for hell? Do you agree that Jesus' admonition to not seek material riches like Donald Trump or Elon Musk? I would really appreciate the panel's answer to this question. They, they, they totally misinterpret that. Yeah. It's not that he was sent there because he was rich. He was sent there because he refused to show grace and mercy to Lazarus. That was, the, that was the issue, and that was the issue is one of the reasons why Judah went into captivity was because of the way they dealt with the poor. Riches, it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. Exactly. I know people that have yeah. money that use that money for the furtherance of the And gospel. they love God, and they're saved. And, and, and uh, to be honest with you, if I was pastoring a church, and I had a person in my church that was a millionaire that tithed, it's certainly I wouldn't preach wow, against riches. Yes, but in that yes. situation, the interpretation of that story is not the fact that God's against riches, not at all, but that God is against those who refuse to show compassion. That was the issue there. Well, I've and, often said... And the fact that his money was his God. His money exactly. was his God, yes. that's true. I've often said God doesn't care what we have as long as what we have does not have us. Good Amen. point. And Good the reason point. why more, pe more Christians aren't rich is because they can't handle it. Exactly. All right. Uh, it's often bothered me, panel, when you tell me to pray for our enemies and our evil leaders. Would you pray for someone who breaks into your home ready to harm you? I don't think so. Uh, did David and man... Uh, after God's own heart, did he pray for Goliath after he killed him? I don't think so. Not after he killed him. God gives us common sense. There would have never been an America if our founders prayed for our enemy. We can pray for our enemies to be saved. Exactly. See, the argument they have is not with us. It sounds like it is. Yes. It sounds it's against us, it's against theologians. Their argument is against Jesus Christ because he's the one who said, pray for your enemies and pray for those who despitefully use you. Love your enemies. Right, love mm -hmm. your enemies. And the whole idea is there that they would change. I, I, I had a situation years ago, Sister Swaggart, where I had an employee that I was working with and this person went out of their way to cause problems for me. They went to my immediate boss and they would tell things and I, I, I mean, it was awful. And I remember, I remember the Lord telling me to pray for this person. And, and <laughs> this is a prayer I wanted to pray. Lord, may the fleas of a thousand camels infest their armpits. That's what I wanted to pray. But what God told me to pray was, pray that they have a good day with me. And I started really doing that and everything changed. And we actually became friends. And so uh, that's why God wants us to pray for enemies for two reasons. Number one, it may change them, but it'll definitely change us. It'll change our attitudes. But well, years ago, I remember I was in a service with the gentleman that I worked with, and after he had finished speaking, service was over. We had said goodbye. We were leaving. So we went out to get in his car, and he discovered that all four of his hubcaps had been stolen off of his car. Uh, and he just stood there for a minute, and he looked at his hubcapless car, and he said, let's pray that whoever stole them will find Jesus. Amen. Yeah. And I remember one time I had my Bible stolen. Stole and I, I Father, <laughs> whoever took my Bible, I pray they read it and will get saved. Amen. The next day, they brought it back. <laughs> I never did know who it was. It never did, but it was there. <laughs> but it was right. So we do pray for our enemies that they get. I remember many years ago, I had a secretary that I was close to. She and her family. I mean, we had I had eaten in their home many times that she was doing things behind the scenes that nobody knew. And like your employee, Mike, yeah. she was going to 
the man I worked with accusing me of all kind of things and I was getting chewed out and I had no clue why. And I'm Father, I don't know what's going on, but Father, that your spirit will be moving and that whatever this situation is, God sent a Jewish lawyer who had gotten saved from San Diego to Tennessee for a few weeks. This Jewish lawyer discovered what was going on and revealed it. And of course she was immediately, I didn't fire her because it wasn't my place, but she was let go. But it took time, but we, I don't see them often, but when I do see them, we're friends and we can talk. And that relationship between her and God was restored. Uh, would you trust her again? Nope. <laughs> Wouldn't hire her again. <laughs> That's it. The Bible doesn't say we got to become their <laughs> yeah. bosom buddies. Exactly. But we do have to learn to walk in forgiveness. Right. Yeah, you need to forgive them. What? Look, John three sixteen. We were God's enemies. We were sinners. For God so loved us. Yes. That he gave his only begotten son. You know, talking what you guys are talking about, I learned this lesson when I was a kid in school, in, in grammar school. Um, a, a girl and I were in an argument, and I don't even remember that much about it, but I remember that we had, I don't know where the teacher called us in, but we went before the teacher. And before I could even open my mouth to answer a question that had been asked of me, this girl jumps in and starts talking to the teacher and telling her all kinds of things about me. And I'm sitting there with, what's going on here? I'd been taught not to lie and not to misrepresent something. And I sat there with my mouth open almost. It was so bad I couldn't even think. To hear this girl accusing me of stuff that had never happened or things that I had done. And my eyes, my eyes were opened at that young age to how deceptive some people can be. Yep. And I knew then, don't trust people. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't distrust them, but I pay attention to what they're saying and not saying. It's, it's quite... Um, startling to me that somebody can just lie on somebody else. But they Amen. can. With mm -hmm. We've yeah. seen it on the news every single day. Exactly. And, uh, okay, anybody else? have uh, Jim, you want to say I, something? Uh, yes, I, I needed to tell this, and I'm going to tell it as quick as I can. But this happened uh, a couple of years ago, and I was dealing with this person in a, in a hospital, and, and uh, they moved her to a different room, and, and the, the nurse that was there was not very friendly and she had heard about her that she was a Christian and she was very effective and uh, she made it very rough on her and so she she talked to me and, and said uh, I don't like her I said she's she said I'm, I'm kind of scared of her and I said you know when we talked a few minutes I said look you know what the Bible says you know you're to pray for them and so a few days later I called back and she said you know it was very hard for me but said I did pray for her I said, she come in my room again to visit me because she knew that I was a Christian. And she said, I hear about you. She said, I'm angry at Jesus because he killed my babies. They had drowned it in a, in a car wreck in, in, a, in a lake or something or another, and they couldn't get them out. Her and her husband could not get them out in time, and they drowned it. And she was angry because she said, Jesus killed my babies. And so she told her, she said, Jesus didn't kill your babies. I said, he don't do that. But I'll tell you what, if you will accept him as your Savior, you will see them. You will go to heaven and see them there, and they will know you, and you will know them. And she gave her heart to Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise and God. And he baptized her with her. And she became in that hospital <laughs> about Jesus. And said, listen, that's what he wants to do. That's he exactly wants to, right. He longs to do that. Amen. He just needs somebody right. to tell him. Amen. Yes. God, have we had a program today? <laughs> my, 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 my. Thank the Lord for our people being saved and brought into the kingdom of God. We thank you for being with us today. Our time is up. We're going to have to close out our part, but Sun Life Broadcasting, continue listening to it. It will be programs on here. That 
bless you. Uh, but quickly, let me ask the panel this. If you were on the program this morning with my husband, this email says that my husband said, many Christians don't know how to seek God as if there's some secret way to seek him. Can you explain that? How do we seek God? There is no secret way to seek God. Panel. I don't know, Dave, were you on the program this year? What do you say about that? I don't remember anything specific like <laughs> you that. You don't remember, okay. I remember but watching it. You, you, I keep it on in my office. Yeah. He wasn't talking about a special formula. What he was talking about is the way most people go about trying to seek God. They, they go through motions, but no relationship. They go through religion rather than relationship. And so, Try to earn his favor. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All you have to do is go to him and ask. 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 Well, that's right. From the heart. Yes. Our, that's we'll be is. back. We'll it be back. From our faith. <laughs> Amen. We'll be back with you tomorrow. Thank you for being with us. We love you and God bless you. Email questions and comments about today's program to onair at jsm.org. Be sure to join Francis Swaggart on Facebook at facebook.com slash Francis Swaggart. Archived programs are available at sunlifetv.com. Francis and Friends is a production of the Sun Life Broadcasting Network. 